And of course, you get the notice about recording and uh, please accept that. Uh, but again, we only record the lecture as such. Yeah, with that, I'm very happy to get started with one very special lecture we have been looking forward for quite a while. It was originally planned to take place in Vienna at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, uh, but in the times we have been facing and still are not entirely out of, uh, we had agreed to uh, have kind of an intermediary step in this award ceremony, which in a way we are sharing today uh, by having the Waldo Tobler lecture online. And of course, we are hoping very much to welcome Blick Anselin in the not too distant future in Vienna and Austria to personally take possession of the award. You only see as an image next to me right here. So there is something else to look forward to. I'm speaking here today on behalf of the Geoscience Commission of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and uh, with the GI Science Prize, the Academy of Sciences is actually honoring Waldo Tobler in recognition of all of his achievements. Waldo Tobler was in many ways connected to Austria and as well over quite a few years of his very early career uh, to my current hometown of Salzburg in Austria. Uh, and uh, we were very glad that he graciously agreed to allow us to name this prize after him. Since the first award in 2016, uh, several outstanding scientists in our field had received that award. Uh, this was David Mark, who unfortunately was passing not so long ago, Tom Boyker, Helena Mitashova, and Mike Betty. And in this uh, series of awardees, we are of course very honored today to add Blick Anselin. To provide a little bit of background uh, to this Waldo Tobler Prize, let me quote from the award document. This prize is awarded annually or biannually to an individual who, like Waldo Tobler, has exhibited outstanding and sustained contributions to the discipline, worthy of inspiring young scientists in geomathematics or geoscience, and has accomplished significant advances in research as well as in education. Therefore, the Waldo Tobler Geoscience Prize 2022 goes to Luke Anselin in recognition of his contributions to the discipline. So congratulations right away here. This prize, and I have to maybe just mention that, uh, is not something anyone can apply for. This is based on nominations, uh, which then go to anonymous reviewers, uh, which usually I don't even know who they would be. Uh, they are nominated by the Austrian Academy of Sciences out from a long list of potential candidates. So congratulations. Uh, Professor Anselin currently is Dean Freeler, Distinguished Service Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Spatial Data Science at the University of Chicago. He held prior appointments at a number of institutions, Ohio State, UC Santa Barbara, West Virginia, UT Dallas, and Arizona State. And he is, of course, recognized worldwide as having established the field of spatial econometrics. He has led the implementation of models and methods in software tools like Geoda, designed to facilitate the insights from data analysis by exploring and modeling spatial patterns. And he has collaborated on other widely adopted tools, just to mention PyCell. These and other innovations and achievements have been recognized through a number of awards by the Regional Science Association, the UCGS. He was in 2008 already elected 
member of the National Academy of Sciences and a few years later, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Walter Tobler, I learned, actually was his former colleague and friend. Uh, many of us will, I guess, recognize the common denominator in spatial analytics, not the least in spatial autocorrelation, and thus really the foundations of spatial data science. With that, uh, look, the screen is yours. I'd be happy to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a real honor to be associated uh, this way formally with my, as you mentioned, my former colleague, Waldo Tobler, who I last met in person at a Western Regional Science Conference uh, about two weeks before he passed away. Um, I actually first met Waldo um, in 1980 when I was fresh out of graduate school uh, and gave a presentation with Walter Eisert at the North American Regional Science Conference. And Waldo, who I had never met in person, sat in the very back. And all through my presentation, he was nodding his head, no, no, no. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And then as it turned out, when he later introduced himself, it had nothing to do with my presentation. So this was uh, my first encounter with Waldo, who then uh, later became a, a colleague and a good friend at Santa Barbara. So um, to honor Waldo, in a sense, I, I'm uh, titling this talk uh, in function of the first law of geography, Tobler's law, and the extent to which or the challenges which one encounters when moving that into a multivariate world. So with that, I'll start sharing my screen and we hope everything works. Um, Something is in the, is in the way here. Yes. Yeah, now in presentation mode. That's good. Okay. So we're good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the challenge of identifying local multivariate clusters. And what I'm going to do is um, first talk a little bit about uh, Tobler's law and then. Um, discuss the problem, the challenge really, of moving this concept of spatial autocorrelation, which is of course very tightly connected to Tobler's law, to a multivariate world, and especially in terms of local cluster identification. And then I'll present a number of um, fairly recent ideas that I've been working on, and then illustrate that with an example of socioeconomic determinants of health in Chicago. And unlike what the abstract mentions, um, I won't be using census tracts, but I'll use community areas because it's a little easier to see on a small screen like this. So as I mentioned, a number of these ideas um, are fairly recent. Just a couple of years ago, I revisited the idea of a local indicator of spatial association and started thinking about um, the problems of moving that to a multivariate setup. And there's a number of different papers where that was uh, expressed. And then I just wanna put in a little plug that I finally got my act together and um, put together um, a, a the geo, what I call the Geoda book um, after about 10 years of being prodded to do so. So uh, hopefully that will come out next year and that has further illustrations and elaborations of this idea as well. So Tobler's Law, many people, most people know about it, but as I found out uh, teaching, uh, not too many people have actually read the article where it was first presented, which is a computer movie simulating urban growth in the Detroit region. And in the very second paragraph, um, Waldo mentioned as a premise, I make the assumption that everything is related to everything else. So basically what he's trying to do is to formulate a population projection model for um, Detroit. And then 
uh, on the couple of pages later, he says, I invoked the first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else but near things are more related than distance things. So the, the essence of this is a, is a population model that has a local um, uh, dependence in it. And um, this, uh, I, I thought it, it was kind of hilarious to see this picture of population growth in Detroit going through 2000. And of course, this kind of model could not foresee what was going to happen to Detroit. And in fact, its population is a fraction of what it was in the 1960s, which this model doesn't show. Another paper, which is maybe not as well known, is titled A Cappadocian Speculation. And it's really interesting, is based on um, tablets from the Bronze Age in um, Anatolia. And uh, in this paper, Waldo and his co-author uh, deduce the location of towns from the frequency in which they are mentioned together in the uh, tablets. So places which are mentioned together frequently are probably closer together in geography than places that are not. So what does this first law really is? It's really a model for population change in function of values in nearby locations, as opposed to in all the other locations in the city. So it's a local operator. It has some similarity to cellular automata. And importantly, it's univariate, which I will return to a number of times later on. And so in 2004, the uh, annals of AG had a special uh, forum devoted to the first law with a number of people um, putting it into perspective and uh, mildly criticizing it. And Waldro's uh, final conclusion was the fact that near things are more related than distance things seems a fundamental property of geography and rather easily explained. And as it turns out, there is a precursor to this idea by Ronald Fisher, the statistician in 1935, where he basically says the same thing, the widely verified fact that patches in close proximity are commonly more alike as judged by the yield of crops than those which are further apart. So that's basically the essence of the law. And so two core concepts, concept of nearness and the concept of relatedness. And in the uh, Tobler formulation, near is geographic, similarity and related this attribute similarity. And then as most of you know, this is a fundamental principle that uh, is behind spatial autocorrelation, spatial interpolation, local analysis, and uh, a whole stream of techniques in spatial analysis. Now, the law is univariate, it's about population. If we think about a multivariate extension, uh, we have the two same concepts, the concept of related and the concept of near. Near in geographic space doesn't change. It's the same thing as in a, uh, a univariate context, but near in multi-attribute space is not that easy. And the way I like to think about it is as a distance in a multi-attribute space. If you think of a three-dimensional data cube, you have the points in the data cube, the distance between those points. So. The concept of multivariate spatial autocorrelation is then about the extent to which nearness in geographical space matches near, nearness in multi-attribute space. And in other words, are geographic neighbors also multi-attribute neighbors? Okay. This is not a new problem. In fact, um, a number of people have thought about this. And once one moves to multi-dimensions, um, there's two major problems that are not necessarily immediately obvious. One is the well-known curse of dimensionality that techniques that work well for two or three dimensions basically don't work when you have a thousand dimensions. So that's a big data problem. The other one um, is the empty space problem, which doesn't get as much attention. But in fact, when you look at the points in multi-attribute space in higher dimensional spaces, they tend to be far apart. There's a lot of emptiness in between them, which means that the distances between them 
become large. And in a very interesting book about uh, dimension reduction, there's some examples of very strange looking distributions in high dimensions. So we have to keep that in mind. So when thinking about multivariate spatial correlation, really it's about tuples, you know, multiple attributes, multiple values that occur at a location, and then tuples at neighboring locations. How similar are these and how can we quantify that and express in a multivariate extension of spatial autocorrelation statistics? And then the, as I mentioned, this has been around for some time and the early extensions were really not multivariate. They were bivariate. They were based on a, a two dimensional correlation matrix where the diagonal elements were the usual spatial autocorrelations like Moran's I or Geary C. And the off diagonals were, were bivariate and because uh, with Moran's eye, it's very easy to do is a cross product. So this doesn't actually lead to a statistic, but typically the pattern that is reflected in this correlation matrix is then summarized by visualizing principal components or eigenvalues or things of that nature. The, um, as far as I know, the earliest attempt to do this is a paper by Wartenberg in 1985, where he essentially um, takes this two by two correlation matrix and then maps the principal components. And um, in 2008, uh, uh, French statisticians um, made this a little bit more accessible by uh, allowing the usual row standardized spatial weights instead of a doubly standardized spatial weights, but it's essentially the same idea. And um, there is no statistic, but it's a map, a series of maps of principal components or and or eigenvalues. There's some recent extensions of this using a geographically weighted regression type logic. Um, you know, the geographically weighted regression originally was developed for regression coefficients, but there have been many extensions, including to um, a Moran's eye, a principal components, mean standard errors. So in this paper in geographical analysis a couple of years ago, this idea was applied to the same cross product matrix um, that Wartenberg started with, but now based on GWR type uh, logic. And then the same author more recently had another approach where he used um, Geary C. And again, we have this two by two cross product matrix, which you see here, which then gets decomposed in terms of principal components, eigenvalues. And again, there's no statistic, but there are uh, maps of eigenvalues or eigen, uh, you know, principal components. Then there's a couple of examples of bivariate actual statistics, global autocorrelation statistics. Lee, in a paper in the Journal of Geographical Systems, had an interesting um, simplification, actually. Under certain assumptions, uh, he develops a statistic that separates uh, the Pearson correlation from spatial correlation. Um, and also, as I will mention in a few minutes, has a local counterpart. And then I, uh, with some uh, colleagues, um, extended the idea of a Moran scatter plot to a bivariate Moran scatter plot. But as it turns out, even though it is in Geoda and people use it, it is probably the most uh, misinterpreted statistic that we have in there because it's very difficult to separate in place in situ correlation from spatial correlation as is. So, so far for the uh, global statistics, then uh, in the local world, it's uh, important to keep in mind that these global statistics do not tell you where the clusters are located, which is in an exploratory sense and very much in today's uh, uh, machine learning and so on sense, that is what it's all about. Where, where are these clusters and to what extent are they for real or may they be spurious uh, figments of our imagination because 
as humans, we're very good to see patterns everywhere, even when they are not real. So there's this idea of the class of statistics, the local indicators of spatial association that has a local counterpart to many global, well-known global statistics like the local Moran and the local Geary statistics. So how do we move this concept to a multivariate world, which is what I started thinking about a few years ago. And the first one is easy, um, it's in bivariate. So we have this idea by Lee, which is the, the two components, and then the idea of a local Moran, a bivariate local Moran, which is very easy to implement, but again, often interpreted incorrectly because of the difficulty of separating out in place correlation with the actual spatial part of it. Multivariate, it's very difficult because the cross product approach doesn't work, even in, in the principal component uh, idea, um, Wartenberg's idea, there's no actual statistic. Now, you can cheat in what I call the indirect approach, is where you um, have, say, 10 variables and you get the principal components and then do a, a univariate LISA on the principal components. This actually works um, in, and oftentimes is a good, good alternative to a full multivariate analysis. But as with all principal components, you have to be careful with what you call high and what you call low, since the sign is not uh, determined. It can easily flip, so, but it works. Then uh, to really move to mul multiple dimensions, um, I thought we have to move away from this cross product idea and really go back to the core of Tobler's law, which is near and related. And uh, near and related are basically the same thing because relatedness in attribute space can be thought of as close in distance in multi-attribute space. So if we think of um, a, a formulation of attribute similarity as distance between points in multi-attribute space, then we're basically in business. And that was the main um, idea I had a few years ago. And then it's actually fairly straightforward to implement this in the context of the local Geary, where uh, for example, for two variables, we easily have the distance in attribute space. And then in a local Geary statistic is just a weighted average where the weights pertain to the neighbor relations of these um, attribute similarity, dissimilarities, these attribute distances. And in essence, a uh, multivariate local Geary is a sum of the univariate local Geary's and we could take the average to keep the scale similar, but that's just to make the interpretation uh, a little easier. So we have this um, multivariate extension. However, as it turns out, um, it's not that easy to interpret. And one of the things that is going on is that in this um, expression, there is an averaging of the distances to the different neighbors. So the averaging of the different um, dissimilarities for different variables means that you can be very close on some and far on others and it compensates. So these compensate for each other. And, and that is not always uh, that intuitive. In addition, um, p-values become a huge problem because there are multiple comparisons, which is a generic problem with any uh, local statistic because you compute the statistic over and over again for every observations and these observations are adjoining. So there's share information. So you, the p-value becomes, um, bluntly speaking, suspect. Um, and it's not clear what exactly it means either. So I've, I've really stepped away from paying too much attention to the p-value, but instead focus on interesting locations. And I'll illustrate that with the empirical example, what exactly I mean by that. 
Uh, it's a little fuzzy, but in the end, I think it provides useful insight, which is really what it's all about. Um, an alternative perspective. So even though it works, I wasn't very happy with the multivariate local Geary statistic in practice because it became, uh, it's useful, but it's um, not easy to interpret. And in fact, if you use what many, many people do and just use a straight p-value of 0.05, it's very confusing. And so instead, focus more specifically on this idea of local neighbors. And we have neighbors in geographic space, either adjoining contiguous locations or k nearest neighbors. And we also have neighbors in multi-attribute space. And this is easy to do, for example, easy to illustrate in a 3D uh, scatter plot, uh, a data cube, where you can uh, link and brush. And this is implemented in Geoda. You know, you find out what the neighbors are of a particular location, and then you see where the points are in the 3D data cube that correspond to these. And um, of course, not everybody is good at looking at 3D data cubes. You have to rotate them and zoom in and out, but or in a cave, you walk into them, uh, but you can uh, connect the geographic location directly to the location in multi-attribute space. Um, but we can go a little further and actually quantify this. And in this idea behind what I call a local neighbor match test, we look at two uh, K nearest neighbor uh, weights, you can express them as spatial weights. They're basically matrices. They uh, formally represent a network structure. So you have the geographic K nearest neighbors from a map or between points. And then you have the multi attribute K nearest neighbors, which can easily be computed using the distances in multi attribute space. And then you figure out how many, which locations for which locations is there a match between those sets of neighbors? So for which locations are the K geographic neighbors also K nearest neighbors in multi-attribute space? Now, a perfect match almost never happens, but we can actually quantify how often this happens and what I call a neighbor cardinality map. And so this map shows for each locations, how many common neighbors there are in these two spaces. And then you can figure out probability. Uh, this is a classic um, nightmare of freshmen in a statistics class where you have you know, your red balls and your white balls and then all kinds of different combinations. So then this idea can obviously be applied directly to the neighbors in geographic space and the neighbors in multi-attribute space. But it can also be applied to situations where you have dimension reduction. And uh, this is really useful when you have many, many variables. It's not you know, a handful, but hundreds. And so then dimension reduction means you basically find a match between the distance in multi-attribute space and the distance in a two or three dimensional space where then points that are close together in the two dimensions are also close together in multi-attribute space. And multi-dimensional scaling has been around for a long time. Uh, stochastic neighbor embedding is a little more recent from the machine learning literature. The difference between the two is that uh, for my purposes, is that multidimensional scaling in its subjective function tends to try to get locations that are far apart well represented because the distance measure is squared, where, whereas the uh, TSNE approach focuses on close neighbors, which is actually more in line with what I'm interested in. So we can apply this to... Um, the variables as they are, or we can uh, carry out a dimension reduction procedure and then apply the same idea to that. So what I want to do now is kind of illustrate this, um, if you wish, warts and all. And 
This is a problem a colleague of mine worked on, socioeconomic determinants of health. There's large literature on this. Um, um, she actually developed a, uh, she used a whole bunch of census variables and developed some principal components that then were given um, a substantive interpretation. And in essence, what we work with is 10 census variables. And as I mentioned, initially in the abstract, I was going to do this for the census tracts in Chicago, but in a, in a slide presentation, it's actually much easier to illustrate this for the 77 Chicago community areas. And given that this is a Tobler lecture, and if you knew Waldo Tobler, he always um, loved to bring up historical examples. And uh, his classic comment at the presentation was, so-and-so presented this 50 years ago or something along those lines. So this follows the historic study of Park and Burgess. Um, in 1920, uh, they delineated these community areas and believe it or not, they're still the same for some, except for some minor adjustments like adding O'Hare, they're basically the same now. So here are the 10 variables per capita income, young population under 20, old population over 65, although I wouldn't call that old anymore, ethnic racial minority, unemployment, no vehicles, no high school, renters, rent burden, burden and then limited English proficiency. And one of the things um, that is interesting about these variables is that they're all over the map. And I mean, uh, if you look at the average, is actually not that interesting. If you look at the range, minimum and the maximum um, is, is astonishing. You know, these variables range, um, for example, no high school from basically everybody having finished high school to almost half of the population not having finished high school. No English proficiency from basically everybody speaking English to 86%, almost 87% not speaking English. So this shows you the variability in multi-attribute space. Um, okay, here, sorry, I have some issues with my mouse. Okay, so this gives you a sense of the, um, correlations between these variables. This is the correlation plot. The uh, dark blues are positive correlation and the dark browns, reds are negative correlation. So as we would expect, high income per capita tends to be negative correlated with a younger population, higher unemployment rates, um, less education, higher rent burden and so on. So this gives you a sense um, that these variables actually cover multiple dimensions. They, they're not all the same. Uh, and some are strongly correlated with others, but others are not that strongly correlated. For example, uh, the over 65 is not strongly correlated with anything. So what we do as the first step is we try to turn this into a principal components. Uh, something is, there we go. Um, so this is where I said warts and all, you know, you, you read these papers where people present principal components and give them a fancy name and uh, an, an understanding. But once you do this yourself, it is actually often very difficult to give meaningful interpretation to these. And uh, these are the three um, most important principal components from these 10 variables. They together explain 83% of the variance, which is quite a bit. Um, the first one, if you look at the uh, you know, traditional cutoff, where exactly this comes from, you know, is, is a little obscure, but 0.3 as a cutoff for the loadings, then the first component is basically higher income, um, no lower unemployment, better education and no rent burden. The second one is uh, renters, but renters that are better educated. Um, uh, they have no cars, they 
have more renter neighborhoods that have more renters. So I, I should uh, qualify here. This is about community areas and community areas are fairly large. So I wouldn't actually call them neighborhoods anymore. And the, the last one is a, is a tricky one. Um, it's high rent and it seems like a more immigrant uh, population. So we collapse this correlation matrix into um, these principal components. And now we step back from the multivariate part into the spatial part. And um, I use here cluster maps for the local Geary statistic. Um, usually I tell my students, don't use 0.05. Uh, that's uh, way too misleading, but it's actually good for some purposes, like um, rather than showing you um, individual choropleth maps, um, this kind of distills out the main pattern of the data. So the, the legend of a local Geary statistic is the dark brown is high, high clusters, the light brown is uh, low, low, and then these are positive associations, but it's not clear what, what exactly they are, and then the blue ones are negative uh, these are spatial outliers. So um, without going into too much detail, um, you see that this, this doesn't match. I mean, there is, if you're familiar with Chicago, there is a north-south uh, divide and there's also a west side. And you sort of see these patterns, but not in everything. For example, the no vehicle one essentially follows the main axis of the um, CTA, the the uh, public transit and the north-south and east-west axis and um, uh, unemployment rate per capita income gives you the north-south divide. There's also a very strong racial divide, a very segregated city. Um, so one might think that Chicago is actually a good example for looking at spatial order correlation because it's so stratified. And the challenge is that actually it may be stratified, but not totally, not the same way on all the variables. And that is the challenge of find, finding local uh, multivariate clusters. So as an alternative to um, doing all these univariate analyses, and if you put them on top of each other, there is very little overlap. And so instead, as I mentioned, we cheat and we look at the principal components. And there we see the first, uh, as we remember, was primarily income related. We see the north-south divide. The second one is a little more complicated. It's more of an east-west divide. And then we get the north-south divide again. But a similar comment, if you overlay these, there is a zero overlap. So uh, what does that help us in terms of multivariate analysis. So now moving to uh, the multivariate local Geary. And again, we can do this for all the variables. And I, I take a very small p-value, which is my typical advice to interpret these. And you do see some overlap that the very high, so there's three extremely significant locations and four here, and they tend to be the same ones these and then these. So those are what I call interesting locations where the neighbors are very similar in terms of their multivariate profile. And here's the local neighbor approach. And on the left, we see the familiar uh, geography, eight nearest neighbors, the network structure. And then on the right, it's a mess, right? So right away, what this tells you is that these two concepts are not the same. And so the question is, where might they be the same? And this is the resulting local neighbor match test using eight nearest neighbors. And we see again, the same locations. These two locations have uh, six neighbors in common, which is extremely rare to out of eight neighbors have six that are both nearest neighbors in multi-attribute space and nearest neighbors in geographical space. So we can um, also link this 
to other multivariate representations. So um, since there's 10 variables, we cannot do a 10 dimensional data cube, but we can do parallel coordinate plots. And so we see here that for this, what I call a cluster, so these are all community areas that have either six or five neighbors in common between the high dimensions and the geographical dimension. And you see that the three uh, parallel uh, principal components are fairly close together and that the 10 variables follow roughly the same pattern. This is called uh, visual clustering in the machine learning um, literature. And there's all kinds of tricks to actually extract patterns from this, but it gives you the sense of what is going on here. In fact, what we're finding is not an artifact. It is something that is unusual and therefore what I call is interesting. And then finally, what we can do is, um, as I mentioned, apply this both to all the variables together, as well as to the neighbors after dimension reduction. And so again, we see the two main locations here, um, the same two locations here and the same two locations here. So this one and this cluster is what I call a very interesting cluster. Um, irrespective of the p-values, um, there is no way that this would happen by chance. And if you know Chicago, this is the Northeast corridor, primarily higher income, professionals, white, higher education. That is very stratified. Now the rest, is a little more complicated. And so then what does that do for Tobler's law? In higher dimensions, maybe not. I mean, it's only in my experience and I've done quite a few analyses so far, um, there is a strong tension between attribute similarity and locational similarity. And whereas in fact, for most variables in a univariate approach, there is a strong local dependence, and this of course also has to do with scale issues. In multiple dimensions, this is not necessarily the case because you have a strong tension between attribute similarity and locational similarity. And we see that in other contexts as well, for example, in spatially constrained clustering or regionalization. If you regionalize, say using a k-means or other similar technique, the resulting clusters are not necessarily and usually not spatially contiguous. So then if you force the spatial contiguity constraint, then you lose similarity in the attribute domain. So um, in some policy contexts, clearly one matters more than the other. Um, whenever space or location access is important, the locational factor will matter more when it is not important then the attribute uh, dimension is more important. From my perspective, and I think what we learn going back to Tobler's law, it's near and related. And we have in multiple dimensions, we have to assess the trade-off between the two. So that's where I'd like to um, stop. Um, I think I'm out of screen share. Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. We can see you in full personal glory. And thank you very much. Uh, and let me thank you on behalf of the audience who can only, as you can see, express their appreciation indirectly. Uh, again, thank you very much from a personal perspective as well. Uh, because I believe this is a lecture we, for more than reason, will be very happy to share, for instance, among our doctoral students, uh, simply because we all come from the background of the spatial sciences, working, having worked with spatial data for a long time. Uh, and then we are to different degrees exposed and attached to the more rapidly emerging 
field of data science and data analytics and the overlap of these two uh, that uh, I think we would all agree on that holds a lot of potential. That's where spatial data science is going to. So the value added from not simply ignoring position, that of course leads to clustering, not only in multidimensional spaces, uh, but in maybe multidimensional spaces where we include the spatial dimension, whether we consider it special or just yet another dimension. So thank you very much for those many stimulating inputs and the practical advice, you know, how to tweak the p-value to tease out uh, the really outstanding elements. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for that lecture, which not only in a spatial data science perspective uh, helps us a lot to further our understanding, but at the same time, of course, building on the spatial autocorrelation concept, uh, which to a large degree goes back to Walter Tobler. So in that sense, I believe that certainly was a very fitting contribution uh, in this particular concept. So let me again congratulate you as the recipient of the overall fifth awardee of the Waldo Tobler Chair Science Prize. Uh, congratulations to that. Thank you very much.